position matters. So that is a myth. IVF guarantees pregnancy. Oh boy, it's a tough myth for patients to hear. Eating pineapple can increase fertility. Oh, that's a good one. Pineapple by itself, if you have infertility, is unlikely to reverse your infertility. I'm Dr. Cindy. I am a fertility specialist based in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I work with patients who are seeking to boost their fertility, preserve their fertility, or build their families. Hello, I'm Dr. Sriram Eliswarapu, and I'm a urologist at UCLA. My focus is on reproductive medicine for men as well as individuals born with testicles, such as trans women. And today, we'll be debunking myths about infertility. Tight underwear is bad for sperm counts. So there have been a number of studies looking at this issue for many decades, and the inevitable question is boxers versus briefs. In truth, it doesn't matter a whole lot, and we know that if the testicles are a little bit warmer, that they are more at risk of having sperm uh, count issues or sperm motility issues, which is the way the sperm move in the body. But in general, it shouldn't matter too much. Just pick what's comfortable. If you're going to be going on vacation and using uh, hot tubs every day for hours a day, I would recommend against that if you're going to be trying to get pregnant because prolonged warmth and repetitive warmth affecting the testicles can drive sperm counts down. And I have seen that in my practice. Sex position matters. So that is a myth. No matter what position you uh, engage in, if you ejaculate, you have the sufficient propulsion of the semen to make it up to the cervix any way you do it. And a number of people around the world have actually studied it, and no one position has been proven to be better than another. Putting your legs up after sex can increase your chance of pregnancy. That is also a myth. Long before I even understood what pregnancy entailed, I was seeing imagery on TV and stuff of people almost on a handstand upside down. And I think the thought is, oh, we need to counteract gravity. But the truth is, you don't need to lay and sit upside down or anything like that. IVF guarantees pregnancy. Oh boy, yes, that is definitely a myth. And it's a tough myth for patients to hear. But IVF does present the highest chances of pregnancy, absolutely. There are a number of factors that play into IVF success. One of them has to do with the age of the eggs being used. It also has to do with the quality of the sperm and the egg when they come together. It has to do with the embryo that is ultimately formed. It also has to do with the genetics of the embryo the chromosome makeup. But then on top of that, it has to do with the womb in which the embryo will be placed and a number of factors that are not yet fully known. So we know the immune system plays a role, diet, exercise probably play a role, but we're still investigating that. So biggest thing to know is it's not 100%. Stress causes miscarriages. I think we're starting to get get away from the term miscarriages, we're starting to use the term early pregnancy loss. Is that right? That's correct. And I think it's because, you know, miscarriage also comes with certain connotations where blame is also ascribed. And the truth is, most early pregnancy losses, there's nothing the individual could have done about it at all. And so now we call it early pregnancy loss before the end of the first trimester versus second and third trimester pregnancy loss. We do not believe stress causes loss. I know in everyday common conversation, people believe that. Um, we know stress can impact one's immunity, but we also know that many people around the world, across millennia, have gotten pregnant and remained pregnant despite tremendous stress. So we know it's not simply stress. Nowadays though, we know the number one reason for pregnancy loss is chromosomal differences in the formed embryo. And so that's called aneuploidy. 67% of first trimester pregnancy losses are due to chromosomal issues within the embryo itself. Other reasons would be if the thyroid was not functioning well, if vitamin D is low, if there's a fibroid in the uterus. If you have a uterus and you've had two or more pregnancy losses, you should be evaluated. For many decades, we always expected that it would be the individual with the womb and the eggs to be the one that gets evaluated for a pregnancy loss. 
now the tide is shifting and individuals who uh, contribute the sperm are also being evaluated when there's a pregnancy loss in the couple. There's emerging data that things like DNA fragmentation, where the DNA that are normally supposed to be very tightly wrapped up in the sperm are somehow unraveled and might have little breaks in the DNA strands. And those breaks can contribute to the pregnancy loss. Freezing your eggs guarantees that you can have kids later. Myth. And the myth is in the word guarantee. If you freeze your eggs, you can stop the clock. And so you're basically freezing the youngest version of yourself at that point. However, there's no guarantee that eggs, even when frozen, will thaw and yield a live-born baby. So it's really a conversation that needs to happen with your specialist based on your age, based on your egg number. Not every egg that's thawed after freezing will survive the thaw. Not every egg that is injected with sperm will actually uh, yield an embryo. Not every embryo that's created, meaning not every fertilized egg will ultimately form a pregnancy. But on top of that, uh, affordability is an issue. Access to clinics that have great protocols and great uh, success rates with their egg thaws. You really need a clinic that has a good track record of successfully thawing eggs and having pregnancies from thawed eggs. Peeing or showering after having sex will lower your chance of pregnancy. By the time you even get up off the bed and make your way to the bathroom, sperm have made their way up the uterus and are on their way to an egg. And so that should not be a form of contraception. Now, what can decrease your chance of pregnancy is if you're someone who douches after sex. And so we strongly recommend against douching in general. It doesn't work for your vaginal microbiome. It doesn't work for your general uh, health. Myths we hear the most. Sperm quality doesn't decline with age. We have this term that we use a lot in medicine called advanced maternal age. So there was not this term advanced paternal age, but that is starting to emerge. And there's a lot of data now that is showing that individuals with uh, sperm that is older, uh, say in the fifth, sixth, seventh decades of life and beyond, is more at risk of forming embryos that have chromosomal abnormalities. Getting exercise, eating well are things that can improve the general biology of an individual. Certainly if it's good for the heart and it's good for the brain, then it's probably good for the penis and the scrotum and the testicles as well. We talked about egg freezing, but sperm freezing has its role, particularly for individuals who may not be in a relationship or may not be thinking of a family at this time, but later on down the road, they might want to produce a family. It's impossible to get pregnant after 35. It is possible to get pregnant after 35. The truth is though that the chance of pregnancy progressively declines as the age of the egg increases. And so you might find greater and greater need for fertility treatments. But when you're born, if you're someone born with ovaries, you'd have somewhere between 1 million to 2 million eggs in those ovaries usually. By age 30, 70% of those eggs are gone. And by age 40, 97% of those eggs are gone. At the same time, those eggs are also aging. And so what we see is that the chance of pregnancy declines very quickly. And then for some people, it declines even faster. So if you have endometriosis, if you're someone who's maybe had surgeries on the ovaries or needed to be on medications, chemotherapy, radiation, all of those things can also further the decline in the egg number. So my recommendation is if you have ovaries at age 30, you should at least be asking your doctor to do a check of your egg number or what's called your ovarian reserve. The best way to get pregnant is to have sex every day. It comes down to the ovulatory cycles and uh, making sure that you're uh, sort of timing things and tracking things, particularly if you're trying to conceive deliberately. We always get this question and I want to know what your thoughts are. Should the couple be trying to conceive every other day during ovulation or every day? during ovulation? I say every other day. 
and it's because one we need to give the sperm and semen enough time to sort of reaccumulate so we can get those millions of sperm um, in the ejaculate so that's the first thing the other is sperm healthy sperm actually survive in the ge female genital tract for up to five days so once the egg is released from the ovary think of the fallopian tube as an arm with a catcher's mitt at the end the catcher's mitt captures the egg pulls it into the arm and then the egg sits around there for 12 to 20 hours waiting for sperm and then if you have intercourse anywhere within the next 24 hours sperm will also get to the egg so that's why we say every other day around ovulation so what that means is if you're someone who ovulates on day 14 you should really be trying to have intercourse starting day 12 then day 14 day 16 I usually say go out to day 18 there is this movement now particularly on the internet discussing what's called abstinence from pornography, masturbation, and orgasm, or PMO. It's also a movement called NoFap. And those individuals say to have the best reserve of sperm or the best sort of power with erections or orgasm that they should conserve for days, weeks, months at a time. This stuff is not scientific at all um, and in fact after a week of storing up this sperm may not necessarily be healthy you are most fertile 14 days after your period starts that is only true if someone has a 28 day cycle if your cycle is 35 days you're actually going to ovulate on day 21 if your cycle is 25 days you're actually going to ovulate on day 11 after your period um, for some people they ovulate on day nine after their period if they have like a 22 23 day cycle so it really takes getting to know your body know your cycle track your cycle so you can truly understand your frequency for your cycle you can never have children after a vasectomy it is in fact possible there are a number of ways to conceive a pregnancy after a vasectomy the simplest way to think about it is to get a vasectomy reversal there are ways of getting pregnant after a vasectomy that don't involve reversing the vasectomy. One of those ways is to go looking for sperm in the testicles or in the epididymis, which is the storage organ uh, behind the testicles that holds the sperm. That can be as simple as a 10 to 15 minute procedure that's done in the office. But that sperm will then have to be used with in vitro fertilization. Eating pineapple can increase fertility. That's a good one. Pineapple by itself, if you have infertility, is unlikely to reverse your infertility. We know that pineapples have bromelin inside of them, which is a compound that is known to be a blood thinner to a certain degree, but it's very, very weak. And you'd have to eat so much pineapple to even have enough bromelin to have a little effect. But if you're looking to add it as an adjunct, to your meals, etc., go for it. You should be having a meal balanced in protein, complex carbohydrates, and fiber. So getting your usual multivitamins and folate into your diet because folate is really important for once you're pregnant. But technically, no, pineapple by itself does not boost fertility. You can't have children if you're unable to ejaculate. You can have children uh, from your own biological material if you cannot ejaculate. If the inability to ejaculate is a medical condition because of prior surgery or because of a medication one is taking or if they were born with that condition, there may be ways of of reversing that condition. There are individuals who come to me who the problem is not so much ejaculation, but the problem is erectile dysfunction. For those individuals, we can use medications, there's injections, there's hormone treatments, there's a variety of things that can be done to sort of treat or cure the erectile dysfunction. More common in my practice is premature ejaculation. And there are uh, different kinds of therapy, different kinds of medication that we can try to prolong the ejaculatory um, latency time. You can't get pregnant right after stopping birth control. That is a yes and no. It depends on the type of birth control. So when we use the term birth control, we're referring to tablets, we're referring to injections, we're referring to IUDs. Once we remove the IUD, you can start working on getting pregnant the following month. If you're someone who was doing the shot, like the Depo-Provera shot, 
it can take up to a year for your ovaries to wake up and start ovulating again. If you're someone who was on a progesterone only pill, you're usually able to ovulate again within a month to two months of discontinuing. If you were on birth control for an extended period of time or what we call the combined um, oral contraceptive pills, it could take up to a year. Myths parents used to believe. If you've already had children, then you'll always be fertile. That is a myth. And in fact, there's something called secondary infertility. Secondary infertility refers specifically to people who already were able to have a child without any difficulty, and then later on go on to develop uh, issues. So we've talked about age-related changes with sperm. So just because someone with sperm has caused pregnancy before, it does not mean that they cannot now have issues with their sperm. In fact, 50% of the time uh, when we're seeing infertility, it involves not just something with the person who makes eggs, but something going on with the person who's making the sperm. Irregular period cycles are a sign of infertility. So I've definitely seen people who thought that because they were ovulating irregularly, meaning irregular periods, they didn't need to use birth control or contraceptives and then were quite shocked when they became pregnant. And so it's important to clarify that irregular periods, while they mean irregular ovulation, they do not mean absent ovulation. There are other people for whom their irregularity literally means they don't ovulate ever. And if that's the case, then whether you wait a year or six months, you actually need help from someone with that. Taking prenatal vitamins will increase fertility. I know nowadays in the fertility space, it's not uncommon to meet a person who's taking 10, 12 tablets per day because they're looking for every tablet they can find that says may boost fertility. But you can certainly try to make sure your body is in its healthiest state when you start trying. We recommend one multivitamin for a menstruating person, in part because every month when you menstruate, you're losing blood, meaning you're losing iron, you're losing some other minerals and nutrients. So having a prenatal that will have extra iron in it is very helpful to just help keep your counts up. And also once you become pregnant, if you were trying to conceive, your body has to share its nutrients with the pregnancy. And so a prenatal vitamin helps. When people talk about them, they're really talking about them in the context of maybe improved egg quality in terms of looking at them uh, under the microscope, etc. But the question as to whether or not it leads to better birth rates, more life-born babies, the jury's generally out of that. From a sperm standpoint, there's been some recent, very highly publicized trials that have shown that supplements are not necessarily useful. Contrary to that, however, there have been some smaller studies that show a benefit in antioxidants in general for overall healthy living. And so if you have a healthy lifestyle, that will improve your sperm quality. You you should try for over a year before seeing a specialist. If you're under 35, you should try for a year, but trying is relative. If you're someone in a partnered relationship and you guys have access to sperm and egg, you've been having regular unprotected intercourse around the time of ovulation with regular periods, and it's already been a year and you haven't achieved, I don't think you necessarily have to wait a whole year before you come see someone like me. Um, it, it's okay to come in and get things checked out. If you're 35 or older, if you haven't tried at all, then try for six months and then go in to see a specialist. I would also caveat that at 40, I wouldn't even necessarily wait six months. I would go in no later than three months into trying. If an individual knows that they're going to be trying to conceive or if they've been having in the couple unprotected intercourse for say a year or a year and a half and no pregnancy has uh, emerged, just walk in, get a semen analysis, see where you're at. But ultimately it comes down to eat well, sleep well, and move your body. Infertility, while a daunting thought, really there are lots of options available. The first step is actually an evaluation. Fertility and infertility constitute this huge spectrum and there are many many ways to get pregnant uh, and many things one can do to help facilitate that and you don't have to stay at home 
feeling embarrassed about it, if you talk to a specialist like myself, like Dr. Ellis Ward, who we are experienced with this and know how to treat you or direct you to the right person.